Reach Young Adult Ministry Sermons Online from Tuesday, October 22nd, 2019 by Philip Jackson, pastor to young adults at Evergreen Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, entitled Saul Despises David from 1 Samuel 18. Okay, turn your Bibles over to 1 Samuel. Bet you guys didn't see that coming. No way. 1 Samuel 17. Uh, we did this, we did most of this story last last time we were together. Um, I was on vacation with my love down in uh, San Antonio or down in touring Texas, so I missed you guys last week. Aw. Um, so but I wanted to remind you of this image, this image from last time we were together. Throw that first slide up there for me, Aaron. Oh, hold on. Oh, there it is. Yes. Okay. You guys remember what we talked about, that this is who we are right here. David holding up the head of Goliath. One thing I didn't realize when I chose this photo or this, this drawing is that it's actually missing the bottom portion. The bottom portion of this f- actual photo shows like his, his head chopped off and a big pool of blood and all kinds of cool stuff. So this one's a little bit more uh, appropriate for viewing in public, I guess. But I just want to remind you of the setting, right? So remember Saul is the king of Israel. And uh, the people of Israel have rejected God. And so they chose, uh, they wanted a king. And so God gave them Saul. Remember, Saul's an insecure guy. And so he does whatever the people want him to do. And so God tells Saul to go, to go take care of the Amalekites, which were a pagan people. Um, and uh, he refused. He, instead, he copped out and he did what the people wanted. And it cost him the kingdom. So then God elevates David, right? So we learned last time we were together that David was a one bad dude, right? We think of him as being this little shepherd boy, but he really wasn't. Um, He was a pretty dangerous guy. You know, you consider that he's out there by himself with sheep, with uh, lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, you know, he he really was a pretty dangerous dude. And so God elevates David when he kills Goliath. Remember, God's in the business of, of preparing impossible situations for us. That's what he does. God loves to do that because he loves to put God-sized problems in front of his people so that he can provide God-sized solutions, right? So this is the nature of who God is. So David kills Goliath. He removes his head, and immediately the army of Israel, they chase after the Philistines. The Philistines, they see Goliath fall, right? They see this, this shepherd boy come over. He's probably um, in his late teens, mid-teens, cuts off Goliath's head, and the people of Israel just just run full speed at the Philistines. And so everybody scatters. And I can just imagine, using my sanctified imagine, I can, imagination, I can, I can picture David, like there's dust flying everywhere because the guys just are running after the Philistines. And he's just standing there covered in blood, holding this giant's head in one hand and holding his massive sword in the other. Thinking, what just happened? I mean, if, if it were me, I would be so pumped right now if I was David, right? Just killed Goliath. This man has been, has been taunting the people of Israel, the, the, these warriors, these people who have seen real battle, and just taunting them for weeks. And yet here he is, and all the chaos is going on around him. So this is where our story, story picks up tonight. So there David, there David is. He's standing there holding uh, Goliath's head. And he, uh, what's interesting is, so what we're going to see is, we're going to see two different responses to uh, God elevating someone and giving them influence. Okay? So you have two different, two different schools of thought that we're going to look at. So, but the first thing I want, you to, I want you to see, though, is that godliness gets people's attention. Okay? So what we got to think about, so imagine the setting here. So there's a little, there's a little caveat here. So we see the battle of Goliath and David, and then it kind of goes back in time. Look at what it says in, uh, in 1754, verse 54, and it says, and David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, and he put his armor in his tent. 
When Saul saw David going out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, as your soul lives, O king, I do not know. So the king said, inquire whose son this young man is. Let me pause for a second. So what is he saying? He sees, so Saul is watching this take place. He's watching David walk down towards the battlefield, towards Goliath. And he has a thought. Remember, God's already sent uh, Saul a troubling spirit. So Saul's in deep depression, right? And so the only way that, can, that, that his, he can get relief from his depression is that David, this kid that he's just sent out to fight the Philistine, would come and he would play the harp for him. So music is the international uh, language of the soul. It's the thing that we go to. You can go to any tribe of people anywhere in the world and they will have music, right? So music soothed Saul's soul. And so Saul is watching this boy, this warrior boy, walk down to meet Goliath, and he, he grabs his general, Abner, who is also a very dangerous man, and he says, who is this kid? Saying, In other words, he's saying, could this be the one that Samuel said was going to take my place? Like, what kind of family does he come from? What's his pedigree? Right, so let's continue. So Abner says, I don't know, verse 56. So the king said, inquire whose son this young man is. Then as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. The world's best entrance into a throne room ever, right? David strolls in carrying this dude's head. Awesome. Verse 58. And Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? So David answered, I am the son of of your servant Jesse the Bethlehemite. So David rolls in, right? And he's carrying this dude's head, just like strolling in to the, to the, uh, the courtroom of, of King Saul. And so Saul, he sees this guy. None of, none of Saul's other commanders, none of Saul's other warriors had the stones to do this. Let's be honest. And yet David, this teenager, walks in, right? Not much younger than you guys. He walks in with Goliath's head in his hands. And so Saul is thinking, oh, my goodness. This guy's different. Let me encourage you in something. Godliness gets people's attention. In a world that's trying so hard to be different, in a world that is trying so hard to be relevant and to be listened to and to be seen as valuable, the world of influencers and social media and the media in general, true godliness gets people's attention. You don't think that people were talking about David? The shepherd boy that just straight up walked out there and just killed this dude without even blinking. See, there's something about pursuing Jesus. There's something about living a life that is in contrast to our world that people take notice of. And there's two responses, right? They either love it or they hate it. Right? There there is a certain infatuation with godliness and what the sad part is, is that we, we try so hard to stand out and to be noticed and to have influence with our, in our generation. And it's literally right here in this book. To live a godly life is, is to live a courageous and bold life. It's to be a David in a world full of warriors standing back away from the battlefield, hoping their name doesn't get called. This is what it truly means to chase Jesus. And there's a reason why we say chase Jesus. There's a reason why I use that term. Because here's the truth, is that following Jesus is not a leisurely stroll down down Memorial Avenue. Chasing Jesus means if he moves fast, I move fast. If If he moves slow, I move slow. I'm gonna move at a breakneck speed because I do not wanna miss anything. I want to be on his heels everywhere I go. I want to share his shadow. And if he tells me move, I move. I don't have time to wait. I've got minimum, maybe 70 years on this world. And I've already blown blown half of it. Okay, I'm 34 now. I don't have time. We don't have time. You don't have time to live a mediocre life and chase stuff. Right? God made you to do more than just collect a bunch of stuff, die and give it away. Think about that. We, we, spend, we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't even like. 
This is the epitome of the American dream. Godliness, it gets people's attention. Saul, he asks what's David's family is from because he's testing his pedigree. He goes, can this, can this guy take my place? As you grow into your calling, people are going to size you up. They're going to ask the question, does this person have what it takes? Can, can they do what they, it seems they can? Some people are going to be threatened by that. Saul sure was when it came to David. But the thing about it is that David, he didn't come looking for a fight. Remember, he was there delivering groceries. He literally was there to deliver groceries. And he's like, hey, there's a fight going on, so what's the big deal? I'll fight him. Is that your attitude? Are you confident in who God has made you to be? That no matter what situation you're in, that you're ready to face it? I guarantee you David was, David was afraid, but he had confidence in who God had made him to be. Don't let other people's assessments of who you are intimidate you to not be obedient. Who cares? Who cares what people think? Remember, David is the youngest of eight sons. I'm the, I am the fourth child of eight, right? I'm not even the youngest. David, my goodness. Don't let other people's small minds and insecurities challenge you and keep you what, from what God has called you to be or what God's called you to do. Forget what they think. Because quite honestly, they're too scared to do anything on their own as it, as it comes anyway. So why would you care about what they thought? A mature believer is someone who doesn't care about what other people are intimidated by. They're obedient. Remember how David faced Goliath. Was he timid? Did he hide? Did he kind of just, just kind of tiptoe there? No, he ran full speed. Ran full speed at Goliath. And Goliath didn't know what to do. Godliness, it attracts people's attention. But don't let their insecurities intimidate you. Okay, the second thing I want you to see is that, that there's two ways to look at God's influence. Okay, so we're going to read on here. So, so remember the setting. So, he, so David's standing there dripping blood on Saul's brand new rug in the throne room, right? And check out what happens next. So chapter 18, verse 1. Now, when he had finished speaking to Saul, the, the soul of Jonathan, that's Saul's son, was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. Continue on verse 4. And Jonathan took off the robe that, that was on him and gave it to David and his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. This is, this is significant, and I'll tell you why. So in 1 Samuel 14, we didn't actually tell this story, but it, it provides context here. So Jonathan is a man. He's not even, he didn't have the guts to go face Goliath. But Jonathan, in his own right, is a warrior. Okay, so in, in 1 Samuel 14... There's a story about Jonathan and his armor bearer. If you, if you are interested, you can go read this. It's pretty cool. So the reason why this is significant about him giving him his sword is that back at, during this period, the Philistines were the only nation in the area that had um, perfected the art of, of mixing tin with iron, making bronze, okay? And so they, they had a unique... Uh, advantage over everyone else in their weapons because they had all these bronze weapons. It says the Goliath's armor was made of bronze, right? So, in fact, they made sure that there was no blacksmiths in Israel. So, in 1 Samuel 14, you've got all this army of Israelites, and they literally have pitchforks, if that, and sticks. And the Philistines have full-blown armor, swords, whole nine yards, right? So, at this point in history, the Israelites literally are bringing sticks to a knife fight, right? And so Jonathan and his armor bearer, they all, they all size each other up, right? This is one of my favorite stories. So the Philistines have 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and it says that the, the people that were there, their soldiers were, they, they had more in number than the, than the sea on the, on the shore, Innumerable, innumerable amounts of soldiers. 
with bronze weapons. There's 600 Israelites. So Jonathan decides that he's going to go check things out. So Saul, is in, he's, he's really feeling insecure. And so what he does is he offers a sacrifice to God, trying to win God's approval without Samuel there, which is a no-no. Okay? So Saul is freaking out. But Jonathan says, you know what? Let's go check things out. So he goes down there with his armor bearer, and he says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to show ourselves to these guys. And if they tell us to hold, to stay put, to freeze, uh, we'll know that God is, is not going to deliver us from this battle. But if when we get up and they see us and they challenge us to fight, like if they tell us to come to them, that'll be a sign to us that God's with us. And so there are only two swords in the kingdom of Israel at this point. One is on King Saul and one is on Jonathan, his son. Only two swords in the entire kingdom, right? So Jonathan, he gets up. Some of you guys know this story. So Jonathan gets up and he shows himself to these, to these Philistines and these guys start taunting him. They say, oh, check out the, the little Israelite came over to see us. Tell you what, why don't you come over here? I'll teach you a lesson. And then Jonathan's like, all right, let's get it on. So he and his, his armor bearer, they go and it says that they killed 20 men in the area of half an acre, which is tiny by themselves. Remember, his sword bearer, his shield, his armor bearer literally doesn't have any weapons. Jonathan is the only one with a sword. They kill 20 Philistines and it causes so much chaos that the entire Philistine army thinks they're getting invaded and they turn on each other and they start killing each other. Jonathan is a man's man. He is a warrior, right? So he, remember, this is the background, right? And so he sees this shepherd boy, this young man, walk into his father's throne room, carrying the head of a recently decapitated Philistine prince. Jonathan is like, finally, finally, there's, a, there's another man here that has the stones to be able to do what needs to be done, who understands that we serve an almighty God who's not afraid of the things that we face. We can do this. And it says that Jonathan's heart was knit together with David's heart from the moment they met. And so Jonathan, giving, giving David his, his robe and giving him his armor and, his, and his, uh, his sword is symbolic. Jonathan is saying, in essence, I'm going to pull you in here. You're going to be my brother. And also consider that Jonathan is not actually David's age. Jonathan is more likely probably 10, maybe 15 years older than, than David at this point. So it's not like they were just like, hey, dude, you're kind of cool. Oh, you're kind of cool too. Let's hang out. Like, it's not how it worked, right? Jonathan was literally taking David almost as his disciple and saying, hey, you're going to be with me. You're going to train with me. And think about what God's doing here, right? He's elevating David to a place of providence. He's already been, been anointed to be king. And then you have the king's heir, Jonathan, taking David and doing the exact same thing. Jonathan had a mature view of who, of who David was. He saw that David was a man of a pure heart. He saw that, that David was a manly man, that he was a man who would be obedient to God no matter what. He saw that, that David was committed to God. And so he said, you know what? If God is with this guy, I'm with him too. No matter what my future is going to be, I recognize as Jonathan that God is elevating this man to do something great. And I'm going to lay my priorities and my insecurities to the side. And I'm going to submit and I'm going to go where God is doing something great. See, for us, we've got to remember that all of us are impacted by God's work. And what happens is, it's pretty common in church that you, you see this with, with pastors with each other uh, across churches, is that they see one church is growing and then one pastor, they, they resent that pastor because their church is growing. And then the next thing you know, there's, there's a feud back and forth. Or this happens just within a church. You see two people that aren't getting along and they're like, of course, they're doing that, whatever. They're, the, they're sellout. And then this other person, then they turn back at them and they, the whole thing just spins out of control. We have this sinful idea that we're competing with each other for God's influence. That's just quite frankly not true. The truth is that we're all on the same team, that we're supposed to work together to present Christ to the world. There are no super Christians and mediocre Christians. There are just Christians. 
God chooses who he elevates, period, dot. And quite frankly, our opinions don't matter because God is God and I is not. So that's the thing about Jonathan here is that he recognizes that God is, is lifting up David. And he looks at that in a, in a mature way and he says, you know what, God's doing something great here and I can either try to fight him and force my own agenda or I can submit myself to God's holy influence and I can see amazing things happen, right? But look at how his dad responds. Saul, on the other hand, it's not a godly response. Saul actually responds in a way that the world would, right? So Saul sees this as, a, as, a, uh, as an intimidation against his power. So look at what he says in verse 2. It says, Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Remember, If you remember the story from chapter 17, when David would come and play the harp for Saul to, 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 to ease his heart when he was anxious, he would come and he would play, and then, and then he would go home to take care of his father's sheep, and he would come back and forth. He would commute to the palace. Well, Saul now sees that David has some influence. And so he's not going to allow him to do that anymore. Last thing he needs is for this, this warrior shepherd dude to be out there outside of his line of sight so he can be out there talking to the people and stirring up support. What's challenging for Saul, though, is that he's fighting against God's own hand. See, there's going to be people in your life, if you're obedient to Jesus, that as you begin to grow and influence, there will be people who resent you. It's going to happen. Remember, small people who have small minds, who don't really believe what they say they believe, they're going to do whatever they can to try to tear you down. They're going to try to make themselves look taller by cutting you off at the knees, which is an ungodly thing to do. And God will take care of them. We're going to see that here in just a second. God will take care of them. But the truth is that as God elevates you in your calling, as you begin to have success in God's eyes, that doesn't necessarily mean in the world's eyes, there will be people who will try to pull you away from that. And they will try to tell you, you know what, you're not qualified to be here. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have this job. You shouldn't have this money. You shouldn't have this house. You shouldn't have this relationship. You shouldn't have these things. You deserve way less than this. And they are so blinded by their own sin and their own pride in their heart that they cannot see what God has done in you. And that is not your fault. They will answer for that, not you. See, you've got to understand that with David and with Jonathan, when we're obedient to Christ, there's a confidence that comes with that. It's not something that God just, God does, is not going to give his influence to someone who's not going to be a good steward of it. Remember, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. It happens over and over again. That is the, that's the backdrop for this entire story, is that Saul is an arrogant, proud, insecure little man who looks really great on the outside, but on the inside, he is a terrible person. And David, who's not much to look at, is a faithful, kind, loving person who believes that God can do anything that he puts in front of him. The thing about it is that David is not soft. David is a warrior poet. A man who God is using this situation to turn into the king that he needs to be to lead the people of Israel. This is incredible. So Saul, he feels threatened by, by David, right? And in David, he thought he was gonna he he needed to defend himself. So check out this other thing here. Not only does does godliness get people's attention, and not only are there different ways to look at God's influence, but there's also this aspect that godliness defines our community. So I want I want to read this real quick. I want to take a small rabbit trail here. So check this out. So flip your Bibles over to Romans 12. Or just change your phone over to Romans 12. Listen to this. Listen to this and think about how, who does this sound like? 
let love be without hypocrisy. This starts in verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving pre- preference to no, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the of the saints, giving to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. And do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give peace to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing, doing so, you will heap coals of fire in his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Living a godly life, living a life like David, not only does it get people's attention, not only does that elevate you and your influence, but also as those people who are ungodly see you and they begin to sneer and they begin to think, little of you and try to try to tear you down. God is what God is doing is he is protecting you from a from a negative and a poisonous community. Okay, check this out. Look what happens to uh, to Saul and how he he goes down the rabbit hole starting in verse five. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. My, My Bible also says that he prospered. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the, in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now it had happened as they were coming home, when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women had come out from, of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, with musical instruments. Ticker tape parade, coming back into, into town. Verse 7, so the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Then Saul was very angry, and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward. (laughs) Watching you, dude, this is not cool. Viewed with suspicion is another way to say that. Continuing in verse 10, it says, And it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied inside the house. So David played music with his hand, as at the other times. But there was a spear in Saul's hand, and Saul cast the spear, for he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped his presence twice. Okay, hold up. That that always gets me, catches me off guard. He's like, yeah, David like dodged the spear and then sat back down and kept playing. Like, no, he, he, no, he didn't come back. Like, he chased him down, and he tried to kill him twice, right? Okay, so now Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but he departed from Saul. Okay, let me pause right there. So as David succeeds, Saul grows to hate him. You got to understand, like, David is like a constant reminder of Saul's mistake. See, for some people, when they see you, as God has elevated you in influence, some people will see you and you may get that thing that, they're, that they want. You may get that job that they want. You may get that, that scholarship that they want. You may get that position or whatever. And they're going to resent you for it. And every time they see you, they're going to, oh man, they're going to be irritated by you. This has happened to me before. Like, I'm just trying to do what God's told me to do. And then I do it and then people get mad at me. This is, this is before I was on staff here at church. Like, this is like working in the political world, for, for example. I, um, I used to work for the congressman here in town, right? And uh, there were people that really had a hard time with that. Like, it's crazy. Peers of mine, people that I would count as friends, that I would hear through, uh, through others that they were talking bad about me behind my back or they were, they were trying to undermine my credibility, things like that. And... It served no purpose whatsoever. But what I realized is that 
how I responded actually was more important than them flapping their jaw. Because it's not about, the situation wasn't about me. The situation was about how I was going to respond to the stress. So when immature people are around us, they don't like when we, when we get attention. And so what do they do? They cause a scene. So you can imagine Saul. He's sitting in his palace, right? He's upset. The other thing that's interesting here is that God's the one that made Paul depressed. It says in verse 10, it says, And it happened on the next day, this is after they got home from the ticker tape parade, the next day the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul and he was upset. So this isn't just Saul here. God is pouring gasoline on the fire. Right? He is making Saul agitated. Because Saul is living with the consequences of his own sin. So God's pouring gasoline on the fire. He's stoking it up. He's making it really hot so that he can temper David to make him the king that he wants him to be. See, God, the thing that, that Saul doesn't realize is that godly influence can't be beaten. You can't, you, if God has his hand on you, literally no one can touch you. No one can because nobody's that powerful. Nobody is that powerful. If you are doing what God has called you to do, you have security and you have confidence in him. And here's the other thing. We have this misnomer somewhere, I don't know where it came from, this whole idea that God created us to chase peace. It's not biblical. We don't chase peace. Peace comes when we're obedient. We're obedient first and then the peace comes. The truth is that chasing Jesus is terrifying. When Peter got out of the boat, as long as he was focused on Jesus, he was good. But the minute he let the storm distract him, he started freaking out, right? But obedience came first. He had to get out of the boat first in order to walk on the water. It's the same that's true with us. When we're called to do something and we're obedient, God is there and we cannot be beaten. Here's another thing. The opposite is also true. There is a, there's a belief that we have to make things happen. God helps those who help themselves, right? As the saying goes. And the truth is that that is false. God does not help those who help themselves. God helps those who are humble and who are obedient. Because God's word says that he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Think about that phrase for a second. In 1 Peter and in James, it says that. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. That means that God actively works against the proud. I don't know about you, but if I fill my life with positive talk and things about how I'm so awesome, that I can do anything I want to, and I'm just going to make it, you know, I'm going to name it and I'm going to claim it, and God's just going to bless me for what I want, I am doomed to a life of misery. Because that means that God is going to actively work against me. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. That means that to the person who submits to God's will, like David, he dispenses grace. When David messes up, he dispenses grace. When David makes a mistake, he dispenses grace. I don't know about you, but I want to be in the grace camp. I don't want to be in the God-resisting-me camp. I've been there at certain periods of my life, and it is miserable. It is so bad because God is a lot more powerful than me. If you are having to force your way to have influence with people, you are not doing it right. If you have to convince people why you're so awesome, you're not doing it right. And it is going to be a really difficult day when you realize that you've worked so hard to have such a shallow following. Because the thing about it is that those who are, who are godly pursuers of Jesus, you literally have to try nothing. Like there's, you don't have to try at all. It just happens. It's called fruit, right? An apple tree doesn't wake up in the morning and they're like, you know what, I'm going to bear some fruit today. And then, oh, and then fruit comes out, right? That doesn't happen. Fruit just naturally comes, right? It's like we have this idea that somehow, like, I'm going to force my way for God to show up in my life. So it's like, I'm just going to sit here. I'm going to concentrate. I'm going to, I'm going to 
blaze the trail, and then somehow, fruit's going to come out. So, I want you to understand that true influence is provided by God. To force our own agenda is sinful. We talked about, Savannah and I were talking about this earlier. In James chapter 4, James, right, he says that, uh, you who say, today or tomorrow, I'm going to go into a city and I'm going to make money and I'm going to do all these things. I make all these plans. And yet you have no power over your life. You can't make yourself one inch taller. You can't add another hair to your head. You can't do anything. You literally have no control. And yet you're the one saying, today and tomorrow, I'm going to go do these things. James says, that kind of talk, not only is it arrogant and prideful, but it's sinful. It's evil, he says. And then he says this. He says, to those who know to do good and don't do it, to them it is sin. In other words, he's saying, we know that we're supposed to submit to God's will and to actively choose to not do that is rebelling against God's will. Think about that. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't plan. That doesn't mean that we don't, aren't good stewards of what God's giving, given us. But the truth is that if we have set our course and we are not going to deviate from the course no matter what happens, we think we know what we, what we want and we're going to figure it out, no matter what happens, God is going to rock your world. It's just the way that it works. So let's read the rest of this. Verse 13, therefore Saul removed him from his presence and made him his captain over a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. And David behaved wisely in all his ways and the Lord was with him. Therefore, when Saul saw, saw that he behaved very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. David was simply obedient. He was just simply a man after God's own heart. He had one job. We have one job. It says this in John 15. And that is to abide in Jesus. Jesus said, if you abide in me, if you remain in me, stay committed to me, I will stay committed to you and you will bear much fruit. David understood this, this power of influence, right? It got people's attention. It got people to look at him in one of two ways. And it cultivated into this life that, that developed a community. Later on, we're going to look at the, the men that God surrounded David with, right? So we know David is a pretty, pretty, uh, pretty incredible warrior, right? He's a pretty brave guy. And he, so he, he goes on the run. Saul, Saul starts to hunt him. And God surrounds him by equally dangerous men. One of my favorite that we're not going to look at in this study, but one of my favorites is this guy named Benaiah. Benaiah is awesome. So this dude ends up being the, the captain of David's royal guard, right? This dude kills a lion with his bare hands in a pit on a snowy day. Not only that, Benaiah also went to battle hand-to-hand -hand combat with an Egyptian, an Egyptian giant, says he was like nine feet tall, with no weapon. And he wrestled the weapon away from the, the Egyptian giant, and he killed him with his bare hands. This was a bad dude right? This guy is like one of David's homies. And he makes, David makes him, makes him the, the captain of his, of his royal guard. God surrounds him with strong men who, have, who are of the same heart. There's confidence in this, right? So for instance, for us as young adults, it can be easy to think, I don't have a community. Hopefully this is part of our community, right? But it's easy to believe that lie that I don't have community. But here's the truth. Is that God sees you. And he knows that you need community. And he will provide it if you keep the main thing the main thing. How do I know this is true, right? So in the Garden of Eden, God makes Adam. And he walks with Adam every day. So in our culture... Our faith is a private thing, right? So I'm just going to do my thing. I'm going to have my quiet time. I'm going to pursue Jesus. This is a private thing for me. I'm not really going to get other people involved. I can do this on my own. I don't really believe in organized religion, whatever that means. There's one thing that God said was not good in the Garden of Eden. One. 
And that was Adam walking with God every day by himself. If you believe that you can walk the Christian walk by yourself without a community, you're disagreeing with God. God makes the garden. He makes it perfect. No sin has entered the world. Adam has perfect community with God every day. They walk with him. And he walks with him in the cool of the day. And God looks down and he says, it is not good that man is by himself. I'm going to make him a community. So he gives him Eve. And he says, now. It's very good. We can't walk this Christian walk by ourselves. And if you're, if you're chasing Jesus, if you're being obedient, God will provide a community for you. Don't be discouraged. Know that God is doing something in your life. There's a couple of things I want to I just challenge you with, and then we'll pray and, and get out of here. For those of you who have a relationship with Jesus and you're walking with him, you're prayed up and you are, you're doing your thing. I want to ask you a question. Are you truly submitting to God in every area of your life? Or are you trying to force your influence? Are you trying to force your influence with your family? Or with your school? Or with your work? With your career? Are you trying to make it happen? You're going to make your own opportunity. Because I'm telling you right now, Saul tried that and it doesn't work. Are you truly submitting to God's influence? Number one. And if not, why? What stands in the way? Are you afraid? Are you ignorant of what God's word says? It's okay to be ignorant of what God's word says. It's here so we can find the truth. And we're surrounded by people that will help us find the truth so that we can know what, what the bedrock of, of who we are is. So if you're a believer and you're not walking with the Lord and you haven't fully given him full control over the influence of your life, I want to challenge you to do that. Get that right. It could be that you don't know Jesus. You know a lot of stuff about God. Maybe you grew up in the church. You know a lot of facts and figures about ancient Palestine, Right? You know who Jesus was. You know who his 12 disciples were. You went to Bible school. You know the names and the places, all those things. But the whole, thing, the whole idea of God having the influence over your life and, and creating and cultivating your story, your life story, is totally foreign to you. You know, your relationship with God is no different than your relationship with mathematics or Abraham Lincoln. He's just a name. He's just, a, he's just an element of your education. I want to challenge you. Come talk to me after. Seriously, I want you to know Jesus. I want you to know him in a real way. God made you to do way more, way, way more than to collect stuff and die and to give it away. God wants you to be David. He wants you to be a mighty warrior in your generation, one who is elevated by God's influence so that he can put you on display to be able to see lives change because of you. But the more you fight him, the less likely that's going to happen. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. James goes on to say, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Cleanse, you hand, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to sorrow. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Know that God is for you, but you've got to get out of the way. What's up, everybody? This is Philip Jackson, pastor of young adults at Evergreen Church. I want to invite you to come to Reach. We meet every Tuesday evening at 630 at Evergreen Church, just east of Mingo on 111th Street. For more information, check out our website, reachtulsa.org. You can connect with us on social media and on Instagram by searching for reach.tulsa. Also, be sure to subscribe to our content for the latest sermons and updates. You can also find us on Spotify, iTunes, and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Bring your glory down.